Good day, class. Let's discuss modes of discovery at the Rules 23 to 29 of the Rules of Court. The following are the modes of discovery. We have depositions pending action under Rule 23, depositions before action or pending appeal under Rule 24. We also have interrogatories to parties under Rule 25, admission by adverse party under Rule 26, production or inspection of documents or things under Rule 27, and physical and mental examination of persons under Rule 28. In general, a discovery is a device employed by a party, the purpose of which is to obtain from the adverse party information about relevant matters in the case in preparation for the trial. The rules of procedure have evolved to their present state in which litigation has ceased to be a game of surprises. Now, parties are allowed to have knowledge of relevant facts in possession of the adverse party and to require the disclosure of evidence even prior to trial. That's why any party may avail of any of the modes of discovery set forth under, under Rules 23 to 28. Here, the court is required to issue an order order requiring the parties to avail of the interrogatories to parties under Rule 25 and request for admission by adverse party under Rule 26, which means that the availment of interrogatories to parties under Rule 25 and the request for admission by adverse party under Rule 26 are both mandatory under the rules of court. Meanwhile, the use of depositions under Rule 23 and or other measures under Rules 27 and 28 are discretionary. At any rate, the court is required to issue an order requiring the parties to avail of Rule 25 or Rule 26, which are both mandatory or discretionary with respect to the use of Rules 23, 27, and 28. Then the order shall be issued within five days from the filing of the answer. A copy of this order shall be served upon the defendant together with the summons and a copy of the order shall be also served upon the plaintiff. What do we understand by deposition? Deposition is the taking of the testimony. When there is a pending case, the testimony of any person, whether a party or not, may be taken even before the trial proper and such testimony is to be taken at the instance of any party to the action. The taking of testimony is what we call as deposition and the person whose testimony is to be taken is called a deponent. The former rule requires leave of court required before the service of an answer but after jurisdiction has been acquired over any defendant or over the property subject of the action. However, under the 2019 amendments to the rules of court, it has now removed the distinction between before and after answer has been served. Now, the court used the uniform language of only upon ex parte motion of any party. Deposition pending action. When may be taken? Upon ex parte motion of any party, the testimony of any person, whether a party or not, may be taken by deposition upon oral examination or written interrogatories. The attendance of witnesses may be compelled by the use of subpoena as provided in the Rule 21. Meanwhile, the deposition of a person confined in prison may be taken only by leave of court on such terms as the court prescribes. So please take note, under Rule 23, there are two methods of taking deposition, by oral examination or by written interrogatories. And during deposition, the deponent may be examined and cross-examined following the rules on examination of witnesses permitted under the rules on evidence. What is the scope of examination? Unless otherwise provided by the court, the deponent may be examined regarding any matter not privileged, relevant to the subject matter of the pending action, and whether relating to the claim or defense of any party, including the existence, description, nature, custody, condition, and location of any books, documents, or other tangible things, and the identity and location of persons having knowledge of relevant facts. 
how do you compel attendance of deponents or parties? The attendance of witnesses to be examined may be compelled by the use of subpoena. The court issuing the subpoena may issue a warrant to arrest the said witness and failure to obey a subpoena without justifiable cause shall be deemed a contempt of the court. What are the consequences in case of refusal to answer? Number one, if a deponent refuses to answer any question upon oral examination, deposition may continue on other matters or it may be adjourned at the election of the proponent. So here, the proponent may apply for an order to compel an answer. If the refusal is not supported by substantial justification, court may order the deponent or the counsel advising the refusal to pay reasonable expenses incurred in obtaining the order, including attorney's fees. The deponent who refuses to answer a question after being compelled or ordered by the court to do so may be held in contempt of court. Second, a party who unjustifiably refuses to answer questions during the deposition may suffer from other consequences of such refusal. Refusal by a party, not by a mere witness, to obey an order requiring him to answer designated questions, the effect, the court may issue an order that the matters regarding which the questions were asked shall be taken to have been established for the purpose of the action in accordance with the claim of the party obtaining the order from the court. Third point, the court may also issue an order refusing the disobedient party to support or oppose designated claims or defenses. The order may prohibit the disobedient party from introducing in evidence designated documents or things or items of testimony or from introducing evidence of physical or mental condition. Fourth, it is also possible that the court may issue an order striking out the pleadings or parts thereof or staying further proceedings until the order is obeyed or dismissing the action or proceedings or any party thereof or rendering a judgment by default against a disobedient party. Number five, in lieu of the above orders or in addition thereto, the court may issue an order directing the arrest of any party or his agent for disobeying court orders except an order to submit to a physical or mental examination. Oral deposition. A party desiring to take the deposition of any person upon oral examination shall give to every party to the action a reasonable notice in writing. The notice will contain the following, the time and place for taking the deposition and the name and address of each person to be examined if known. If not known, there must be a general description sufficient to identify him or her or the particular class or group to which he or she belongs. Orders for the protection of parties and deponents. After service of notice for taking a deposition by oral examination, the court upon motion by any party or by the person to be examined and for good cause shown may make the following orders. That the deposition shall not be taken or that the deposition may be taken only at some designated place other than that stated in the notice. That the deposition may be taken only on written interrogatories or that certain matters shall not be inquired into. Or letter E, that the scope of the examination shall be held with no one present except the parties to the action and their officers or counsel. Or letter F, that after being sealed, the deposition shall be opened only by order of the court. Or letter G, that secret processes, developments, or research need not be disclosed. Or letter H, that the parties shall simultaneously file Specify documents or information enclosed in sealed envelopes to be opened as directed by the court. Court may make any other order which justice requires to protect the party or witness from annoyance, embarrassment, or oppression. Here are some guidelines in the taking of oral deposition. Number one. With respect to record of examination, oath, and objections. Letter A. The officer before whom the deposition is to be taken shall put the witness on oath. 
and shall personally or by someone acting under his or her direction and in his or her presence record the testimony of the witness. Letter B. The testimony shall be taken stenographically unless the parties agree otherwise. Letter C. With respect to objections, all objections made at the time of the examination to the qualifications of the officer taking the deposition or to the manner of taking it or to the evidence presented or to the conduct of any party and any other objection to the proceedings shall be noted by the officer upon the deposition. Uh, please note that under the rules of court, it does not provide that the officer has to rule on the objection, but the officer shall only note the objections. Letter D. In lieu of participating in the oral examination, parties served with notice of taking a deposition may transmit written interrogatories to the officers who shall propound them to the witness and record the answers verbatim. Second, with respect to motion to terminate or limit examination. At any time during the taking of the deposition on motion or petition of any party of the deponent and upon showing that the examination is being conducted in bad faith or in such manner as unreasonably to annoy, embarrass, oppress the deponent or any party, the court in which the action is pending or the regional trial court of the place where the deposition is being taken may order the officer conducting the examination to cease forthwith from taking the deposition or the court may issue an order limiting the scope and manner of the taking of the deposition. If the order may terminate the examination, it shall be resumed thereafter only upon the order of the court in which the action is pending. In granting or refusing such order, the court may impose upon either party or upon the witness the requirement to pay such cost or expenses as the court may deem reasonable. Third, submission to witness changing and signing. Letter A, when the testimony is fully transcribed, the deposition shall be submitted to the witness for examination and shall be read to him unless such examination and reading are waived by the witness and by the parties. Letter B. Any changes in the form or substance which the witness desires to make shall be entered upon the deposition by the officer with a statement of the reasons given by the witness for making them. So the witness may change the form or substance provided that there should be a statement of the reasons given by the witness for making them. Letter C. The deposition shall then be signed by the witness unless the parties, by stipulation, waive the signing or the witness is ill or cannot be found or refuses to sign. If the deposition is not signed by the witness, the officer shall sign it and state on the record the fact of the waiver or the illness or absence of the witness or the fact of the refusal to sign together with the reason given, therefore, if any. Then the deposition may be used as fully as though signed unless a motion to suppress under Section 29, Paragraph F, Rule 23, the court holds that the reasons given for the refusal to sign require rejection of the deposition in whole or in part. Thereafter, the officer shall certify on the deposition that the witness was duly sworn to by him and that the deposition is a true record of the testimony given by the witness. Thereafter, the officer shall securely seal the deposition in an envelope endorsed with the title of the action and marked deposition of the name of witness. And the officer shall promptly file it with the court in which the action is pending or send it by registered mail to the clerk of court for filing. Thereafter, the officer taking the deposition shall give prompt notice of its filing to all the parties. Um, with respect to furnish of copies, upon payment of reasonable charges, the officer shall furnish a copy of the deposition to any party or to the deponent. Let's move on to deposition upon written interrogatories. 
as a rule, a deposition need not be conducted through an oral examination because it may also be conducted through written interrogatories. A party desiring to take the deposition of any person upon written interrogatories shall serve the interrogatories upon every other party with a notice stating the name and address of the person who is to answer them and the name and descriptive title and address of the officer before whom the deposition is to be taken. The party served with the interrogatories may also serve cross-interrogatories upon the party proposing to take the deposition within 10 calendar days from service of the written interrogatories. The, the latter may within 5 calendar days serve redirect interrogatories. And finally, within 3 calendar days after being served with redirect interrogatories, a party may serve recross interrogatories upon the party proposing to take the deposition. So 10, 5, and 3 calendar days for cross interrogatories, redirect interrogatories, and recross interrogatories respectively. Officers to take responses and prepare record. A copy of the notice and copies of all interrogatories served shall be delivered by the party taking the deposition to the officer designated in the notice. The officer shall promptly proceed to take the testimony of the witness in response to the interrogatories and to prepare, certify, and file or mail the deposition attaching thereto the copy of the notice and the interrogatories received by him or her. Notice of Filing and Furnishing Copies When a deposition upon interrogatories is filed, the officer taking it shall promptly give notice thereof to all the parties and may furnish copies to them or to the deponent upon payment of reasonable charges, therefore, before whom is deposition taken. If a party is within the Philippines, deposition need not be taken before a judge, although it may be taken before him. It may also be taken before a notary public or before any person authorized to administer oath if the party so stipulate in writing. How about if the party is outside the Philippines? A deposition may be taken before a secretary of an embassy or legation, consul general, consul, vice consul, or consular agent of the Republic of the Philippines, or such other person or officer as may be appointed by commission or letters rogatory, or by any person authorized to administer oath by written stipulation of the parties. Please take note that no deposition shall be taken before a person who is a relative within the sixth degree of consanguinity or affinity or employee or counsel of any of the parties or a relative within the same degree or employee of such counsel or one financially interested in the action. Use of depositions pending action. Any part or all of the depositions so far as admissible under the rules and evidence may be used against any party who was present or represented at the taking of the deposition or against one who had due notice of the deposition. The deposition or any of its parts may be used at the trial or upon the hearing of a motion or an interlocutory proceeding. The deposition may be used for the following purposes. For contradicting or impeaching the testimony of the deponent as a witness, for any purpose by the adverse party where the deponent is a party, or at the time of taking the deposition was an officer, director, managing agent of a public or private corporation, partnership, or association which is a party, or letter C, for any purpose by any party where the deponent is a witness, whether or not a party if the court finds that the witness is dead or the witness resides more than 100 kilometers from the place of trial or hearing or is out of the Philippines unless it appears that his or her absence was procured by the party offering the deposition or that the witness is unable to attend or testify because of age, sickness, infirmity, or imprisonment, or that the party offering the deposition has been unable to procure the attendance of witnesses by subpoena, or when exceptional circumstances exist upon application and notice. 
what is the effect of substitution of parties? The substitution of parties does not affect the right to use the deposition previously taken. When an action has been dismissed and another action involving the same subject and between the same parties or their representatives or successors in interest is afterwards brought, all depositions lawfully taken and duly filed in the former action may be used in the latter as if originally taken. What is the effect of taking depositions? A party shall not be deemed to make a person his or her own witness for any purpose by taking his or her deposition. That's why a person whose deposition is taken by a party does not by reason of such deposition make such person the witness of said party. What is the effect of using a deposition of a person? The introduction of a deposition or any part thereof makes the deponent the witness of the party introducing the deposition if the purpose is other than that of contradicting or impeaching the deponent. However, this rule is not applicable with respect to the use of a deposition of a party or anyone who, at the time of taking the deposition, was an officer, director, or managing agent of a public or private corporation, which is a party of the case. Let's move on to depositions before action or pending appeal under Rule 24 of the Rules of Court. When are depositions before action availed of? A party who desires to perpetuate his, his or her own testimony or that of another person regarding any matter that may be cognizable in any court in the Philippines may file a verified petition. So for deposition before action, it is initiated by filing a verified petition in the court of the place of the residence of any expected adverse party. What are the contents of the petition? It shall contain the name of the petitioner and shall show that the petitioner expects to be a party to an action in a court of the Philippines but is presently unable to bring it or cause it to be brought. It shall also contain the subject matter of the expected action and his or her interest therein, the facts which he or she desires to establish by the proposed testimony and his or her reasons for desiring to perpetuate it. The names or description of the persons he or she expects will be adverse parties and their addresses so far as known and the names and addresses of the persons to be examined and the substance of the testimony which the petitioner expects to elicit from each and shall ask for an order authorizing the petitioner to take the depositions of the persons to be examined named in the petition for the purpose of perpetuating their testimony. Perpetuation of testimony before action. So what are the steps or procedures? First, petitioner shall serve a notice upon each person named in the petition as an expected adverse party together with a copy of petition stating that the petitioner will apply to the court at the time and place therein for the order described in the petition. Second, if the court is satisfied that the perpetuation of the testimony may prevent a failure or delay of justice, it shall make an order designating or describing the persons whose depositions may be taken, specifying the subject matter of the examination and whether the deposition shall be taken upon oral examination or written interrogatories. And then the depositions may be taken in accordance with Rule 23 before the hearing. Third, the deposition taken under Rule 24 is admissible in evidence in any action subsequently brought involving the same subject matter. How about depositions pending appeal? If an appeal has been taken from a judgment of a court, including the Court of Appeals in proper cases, or before taking of an appeal, if the time therefore has not yet expired, the court in which the judgment was rendered may allow the taking of depositions of witnesses to perpetuate their testimony for use in the event of further proceedings in said court. Second, the party who desires to perpetuate the testimony may make a motion, no need for petition because the action is already pending. So make a motion in said court for leave to take the depositions. Third, the contents of the motion. It shall state the names and addresses of the persons to be examined, 
the substance of the testimony and the reason for perpetuating their testimony. Fourth, the court shall allow the depositions if it finds that the perpetuation of the testimony is proper to avoid a failure or delay of justice. The depositions may be taken and used in the same manner and under the same conditions prescribed for depositions taken in pending actions. Let's proceed to Rule 25, Interrogatories to Parties. What is the purpose of interrogatories to parties? This mode of discovery is availed of by a party to the action for the purpose of eliciting material and relevant facts from any adverse party. The purpose is to assist the parties in clarifying the issues and in ascertaining the facts involved in a case. Um, for interrogatories to parties, the guidelines to be observed by trial court judges in the conduct of pre-trial mandates, the, the issuance of an order requiring the parties to avail of interrogatories to parties under Rule 25. Interrogatories to parties are not directed against a particular pleading, so this is not related to bill of particulars. Instead, they seek the disclosure of all material and relevant facts from any party. The interrogatories to parties are served directly upon the adverse party. So comparing that to Rule 23 on deposition pending action, written interrogatories in a deposition are not served upon the adverse party directly, but delivered to the officer designated in the notice. So I hope you can spot the difference between Rule 23 and Rule 25. So these are the procedures in interrogatories to parties. Number one, the mode of discovery is availed of by filing and serving upon the adverse party written interrogatories to be answered by the party served. If a party is a juridical entity, the written interrogatory shall be answered by any of its officers competent to testify in its behalf. Second point, no party may without leave of court serve more than one set of interrogatories to be answered by the same party. Third, the interrogatories shall be answered fully in writing, signed and sworn to by the person making them. The party upon whom the interrogatories have been served shall file and serve a copy of the answers on the party submitting the interrogatories within 15 calendar days after service thereof. The period may be extended or shortened by the court upon motion and for good cause shown. Fourth, the party against whom it is directed may make objections to the interrogatories. If he does so, said objections shall be presented to the court within 10 calendar days after service of the interrogatories. The filing of the objections shall have the effect of deferring the filing and service of the answer to the interrogatories until the objections are resolved. What is the effect of failure to serve written interrogatories? A party not served with written interrogatories may not be compelled by the adverse party to give testimony in open court or give deposition pending appeal unless allowed by the court for good cause shown and to prevent a failure of justice. Let's proceed to admission by adverse party under Rule 26. What is the purpose of admission by adverse party? This is to allow one party to request the adverse party in writing to admit certain material and relevant matters which most likely will not be disputed during trial. And another purpose is to avoid the necessary inconvenience to the parties in going through the rigors of proof before the trial. When request is made, at any time after issues have been joined, a party may file and serve upon any other party a written request for the latter to admit the genuineness of any material and relevant document described in and exhibited with the request or to admit the truth of any material and relevant matter of fact set forth in the request. What is the effect of failure to file and serve written request for admission? As a consequence of the failure to avail this mode of discovery, the party shall not be permitted to present evidence on facts that are material and relevant and which are 
or ought to be within the personal knowledge of the other party unless otherwise allowed by the court for a good cause shown and to prevent a failure of justice. Please note that within one day from receipt of the complaint, the rules mandates the preparation of the summons and the issuance of an order requiring the parties to avail of interrogatories to parties under Rule 25 and request for admission by adverse party under Rule 26, which means both are mandatory. The party to whom the written request is directed shall file and serve upon the party requesting the admission a sworn statement, either specifically denying the matters of which admission is requested, or if he does not deny the same, to set forth in detail the reasons why he cannot truthfully admit or deny those matters. This sworn statement shall be filed and served within the period designated in the request. It shall not be less than 15 calendar days from the service of such request or within such further time as the court may allow on motion. What is the effect of failure to file and serve a sworn statement of denial? If a party to whom the written request for admission is directed does not file the required sworn statement, each of the matters of which an admission is requested shall be deemed admitted. Please take note that a request for admission can be the basis of a summary judgment. The request can be the, ba the basis thereof when its subject is deemed to have been admitted by the party as a result of that party's failure to respond to the request. What is the effect of admission? Any admission made by a party as a consequence of the failure to comply with the request is only for the purpose of the pending action and shall not be deemed an admission for any other purpose. The admission cannot be used against the admitting party in any other proceeding. Um, deferment of compliance. To avoid implied admission, the party requested may request that the filing and service of the sworn statement be deferred. This deferment may be effected by the filing with the court objections to the request for admission within the period for and prior to the filing of his sworn statement. So compliance should be deferred until such objections are resolved by the court. Let's proceed to Rule 27, production or inspection of documents or things. What is the purpose of production or inspection of documents or things? The purpose of this mode of discovery is to allow a party to seek an order from the court in which the action is pending to order any party to produce and permit the inspection and copying or photographing by on or on behalf of the moving party of any designated documents, papers, books, accounts, letters, photographs, objects, or tangible things not privileged and which constitute or contain evidence material to any matter involved in the action, which are in possession, custody, or control of a party. Or another purpose is to secure an order that any party permit entry upon the designated land or other property, which is in the possession or control of the party for the purpose of inspecting measuring, surveying, or photographing the property or any designated relevant object or operation thereon. The order shall specify the time, place, and manner of making the inspection and taking copies of photographs and may prescribe such terms and conditions as are just. In the production or inspection of documents or things, the scope of discovery is to be liberally construed so as to provide the litigants with information essential to the fair and amicable settlement or expeditious trial of the case. All parties are required to lay their cards on the table so that justice can be rendered on the merits of the case. So while the grant of a motion for production of a document is discretionary in the part of the trial court judge, nevertheless, it cannot be arbitrarily or and reasonably denied because to do so would bar access to relevant evidence that may be used by a party litigant and hence impair his fundamental right to due process. So the test to be applied by the trial court judge in determining the relevancy of documents is one of reasonableness and practicability. 
the documents, papers, books, accounts, letters, photographs, objects or tangible things that may be produced or inspected should not be privileged against disclosure. So this is on the ground of public policy. So the rules provide that books and papers are not authorized for production or inspection if it pertains to privilege matter because of their confidential and privilege character which could not be received in evidence. So such condition is in addition to the requisite that the items be designated and must constitute or contain evidence material to any matter involved in the action and which are in the party's possession, custody, or control. We have some examples of privilege communication, which, of course, is a disqualification. We have communication between husband and wife, communication between an attorney and client, communication between physician and patient, communication between the priest and penitent, communication of public officers involving public interest, or editors may not be compelled to disclose the source of published news, or voters may not be compelled to disclose for whom they voted. Another privileged communication is with respect to trade secrets. Number nine, we have information contained in tax census returns. And tenth example of a privileged communication or privileged document is with respect to bank deposits. Let's proceed to Rule 28, Physical and Mental Examination of Person. What is the purpose? This mode of discovery applies to an action in which the mental or physical condition of a party is in controversy. So the court in which the action is pending may, in its discretion, order the party to submit to a physical or mental examination by a physician. We, examples of this action would be an action for annulment of a contract where the ground relied upon is insanity, or in a petition for guardianship of a person alleged to be insane, or in an action to recover damages for personal injury where the issue is the extent of the injuries of the plaintiff. What are the procedures? First is to obtain an order for examination, which may be made only on a motion filed for good cause shown. So the motion shall specify the time, place, manner, conditions, and scope of the examination and the person or persons by whom it is to be made. And there should be notice to the party to be examined and to all other parties. Second is the report of findings. The party examined may request the party causing the examination to be made to deliver to him a copy of a detailed written report of the examining physician setting out his findings and conclusion. But please be careful because after such request and delivery, the party causing the examination to be made shall be entitled upon request to receive from the party examined a like report of any examination previously or thereafter made of the same mental or physical condition. Third point, if a party examined refuses to deliver the report, the court may make an order requiring the delivery on such terms as are just. If it is the physician who fails or refuses to make a report, the court may exclude his testimony if offered during trial. And finally, there is a waiver of privilege. By requesting and obtaining a report of the examination or by taking the deposition of the examiner, the party examined waives any privilege he or she may have in that action or any other involving the same controversy regarding the testimony of every other person who was examined or may thereafter examine him or her in respect of the same mental or physical examination. And that ends our discussion. Thank you.